19th century, there was a rather well-known physician who had a very famous son named Oliver Wendell Holmes. This gentleman was Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. And Dr. Holmes said something that I believe is very important. He said, beware how you take away hope from another human being. Meaning that a medical practitioner should never dare deny hope by sitting in judgment over another human being, handing down a fixed sentence of days, weeks, or months of remaining life, even if the patient and family expect them to do so. Omniscience, being all-knowing, is not the purview of the medical profession. And an MD should never write off a patient as a hopeless case. Now, sadly, Dr. Holmes's admonition, it often goes unheeded. There are patients who affect what seem like miraculous cures, where despite the medical profession's expectations to the contrary, they improve. And these people provide us with a very interesting object lesson. That is, at the moment of clinical diagnosis, closing off options for improvement and the chances for things getting better is not only premature and demoralizing, it's also medically misguided. The centrality of hope in patient care has been the life work of Dr. Jerome Groupman, who is an oncologist hematologist who, um, who has worked out of uh, UCLA Medical Center and Boston General Hospital over a career that has spanned several decades, beginning in the late 1970s. Dr. Brutman wrote the book, The Anatomy of Hope, How People Prevail in the Face of Illness. And I'd like to share with you some of Dr. Brutman's findings. So we as human beings have long acknowledged the need for hope. Many of you are familiar with Tehillim, known in English as Psalms. You've probably, if not read it yourselves, heard Psalm 23. It's often, it's the part of Tehillim that's given on TV uh, funerals very often. And it says, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you, meaning God, are with me. And in the spirit of being eclectic, this this psalm is also, of course, embraced by, by Christianity. And to take it further, uh, the Greek philosophers also acknowledge the need for hope. Aristotle was believed to have said, hope is but a waking dream. And the Socratic philosophers interpreted that to mean that anticipating that one could expect, at, at the very least, the real possibility of a good outcome is essential to the human condition. But what about the right to hope? There's a lot of talk about rights these days. I've grown up hearing a lot about rights as a kid. I'd heard about women's rights, and human rights, civil rights, and then later on I started hearing about reproductive rights and gay rights. And then it began getting even more interesting. When I was a civilian medic in New York State shortly before I made Aliyah, I started hearing a lot about patients' rights. Okay? And at first, what this meant was more, more practical, everyday things like being fully informed of your medical condition, being told by your doctor or about the drug company about the side effects of the medications that you were taking, or, um, or having, ac having access to your medical records, and stuff like that. But even in those early days, before I'd really given it much thought, something seemed to be missing. Now, Dr. Brutman includes the right to hope as a very fundamental part of patients' rights. And I just want to be clear about Dr. Rubin. This isn't some quack uh, snake oil salesman that, that, that you see on YouTube. This is, a, this is a very serious and highly regarded expert on blood cancer, okay? And Dr. Rubin breaks down the right to hope into basically two things. First of all, give the patient hope based on medical facts, while at the same time, never daring take away whatever hope a patient might have acquired on his or her own through things like, uh, pet, like uh, pastoral care, psychology, or their own spiritual endeavors. 
To be clear, the right to hope means tempering fantasy with facts, but at the same time acknowledging, acknowledging it as a basic right. And Dr. Rubin would claim that this awareness is part of the, of part of the good bedside manner of, of, of any practicing doctor. I'd like to focus a little bit on the difference between false hope and true hope. To be clear, hope does not mean lying to patients or to their families, nor does it mean giving the patient only the upside while ignoring the very real possibility for deterioration, disability, or even, God forbid, death. In fact, Dr. Rubin would argue that in order for hope to be effective, the likelihood or chance of success has to be balanced with the very real possibility of failure. For example, suppose a patient is given a 20% possibility that chemotherapy or radiation or some newly engineered genetic treatment or, or enzymatic treatment will turn back an aggressive tumor. Well, focusing on that 20% is not only recommended, but it's actually essential for hope to take root. Yet at the same time, in order for that, for that feeling of hope to really take hold in, in, the, in the essential self of the human being, and Dr. Grootman uh, actually uses the word soul to take root in, the, in, in their neshama, the patient has to be informed of the other 80%, including difficulties like side effects and you know, all the sorts of things we talked about that could lead to, to disability or death. So sometimes a disease or a medical condition will, as we know, sadly, it will result in death. On the other hand, we also have this, 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 this body of, uh, of, of seemingly miraculous cures that people have achieved to, to counterbalance that. So what's really of ultimate importance here is that whether you're working in medical science, in pastoral care, or in the realm of clinical psychology, that you consider that scenarios for improvement best occur where hope is taking place. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation.